Welcome to the Armani Talks YouTube channel. I'm your host, Armani Talks. In this channel, I'm covering communication skills in order to help you level up your way with words and become much more articulate in expressing your ideas. If this is your first time on the channel, welcome aboard. Every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I'm dropping brand new videos on topics such as public speaking, social skills, creative writing, along with other topics which will help you improve the intangibles, the street smarts, knowledge which you were never taught in school. Join the tribe by hitting the subscribe button right on below. Hit that bell notification so you never miss another video again. If you're a returning viewer, be sure to drop that like on your way in. And let's get started with today's talk, which is about ending mumbling forever. In my book, Speak Easy, How to Be Articulate, Assertive, and Audacious Around People, I talk about the role that beliefs have in how you speak. And in today's video, I'm going to be focusing on the last A, which is how to be audacious around people. Audacious does not mean to act like a buffoon. Instead, it means to move in a way where you don't have much doubts. Because if your mind is filled with doubts, you may have a true message, but the way that you're delivering it is always going to seem uncertain. A person removes doubts once they have clarity. And once a person has clarity, speaking in a confident way where they're not mumbling is not rocket science. It's just a way of life. There's different reasons why people mumble. Some people mumble due to physical issues. Maybe their face is a little too stiff. Other times, they're mumbling after a long day. They probably have a job where they have to speak a lot. And at the end of the day, they just want to chill. They want to turn on the TV and watch some squid games. And unfortunately, their roommate is yapping away, talking to them nonstop. And due to physically being tired, they don't want to speak too much, but they don't want to be rude by being silent. So they're in that weird territory where there's doubt in the voice. That's one reason people mumble. But the other reason is due to beliefs. Whether people want to hear that or not, it is due to beliefs. And what we're going to be doing with this episode is giving you that clarity that you need. The brain loves to make things complex. Awareness loves simplicity. And you become more aware by hearing stories. In today's episode, it's going to be a two-in-one combo. I'm going to tell you a story that teaches the art of how to give and how to take. And this story is going to plug in beautifully with how to speak and how to be silent. Once you notice the parallels, you will simply not be able to unsee it. And this is going to help you speak in an audacious manner whenever you're dealing with people. If you're ready and excited for today's video, go on and drop that like for me right on below. Roughly around 2012, I had a friend who was in a car and that car ended up getting into an accident. I was surprised. I wasn't expecting this friend of mine to die so young. And it's even more unfortunate because he was in the passenger seat. When you're in the passenger seat, you have such little control. And that's something that stuck out to me. The next week, I ended up going to his funeral where I saw a bunch of his family members. And one guy who caught my eye was his older brother. My friend's older brother, let's just call him Jacob, was this big dude. He was roughly six foot eight, had huge shoulders, and look like our gargantuan size of my deceased friend. So as the funeral is winding down, I go up to Jacob and I'm like, hey, what's up, dude? My name is Arman. Jacob looks down at me and he's like, I know, my brother used to talk about you all the time. That's when I look up at Jacob and I don't really know what to say. I'm not one of the best shoulders to cry on, so I keep it short and to the point. I say, Jacob, 
your brother was a good friend of mine. If you ever need anything, do not hesitate to text me, okay? Here's my number. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but you live right down the street from me. Jacob took my number and he said, he'll hit me up if he ever needs anything. One week passes by. He still hasn't hit me up. So at this point, I decide I'm going to shoot him a text. I write, yo, Jacob, this is Armand. I just wanted to let you know, if you need anything, hit me up. Jacob responds back, sure, I'll let you know if anything comes up. Another week passes by, and I still haven't gotten a response. Once again, I shoot him a text. I'm like, if you need anything, hit me up. And once again, he responds back, sure, I'll hit you up if, you, if I need anything. At this point, he's not hitting me up. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy's moving on rather quickly. Two weeks passes by. I end up having a long day. And finally, I come back to my place. I take a shower and I get into house clothes. And as I get out of the shower, I check my phone and I noticed I got two missed calls from Jacob. That's strange. So I call him back and Jacob answers. Jacob says, hey, uh, Armand, um, I want to ask you something. I was like, go ahead. Um, so yeah, um, I'm getting my brother's uh, car and um, I'm selling it. And the only person who um, wants to buy it lives in St. Pete. And the only time he's going to buy it is right now. So I'm driving my brother's car to St. Pete and I need someone to pick me up from there. If you leave right now, you'll be able to meet me by the time I'm done with the deal. And the way he was saying it, you could tell he's not used to asking for favors. And another part of him is sad because he's selling his brother's car who just recently passed away. And without second thought, I was like, you know, you don't gotta hesitate, dude. I got you. I'll head over to St. Pete right now, which is roughly 45 minutes away from where I lived. I put on outside clothes and I started driving. What's supposed to take 45 minutes ends up taking one and a half hours. That's how packed the roads were. And to make it worse, I couldn't play music or anything like that because my stereo wasn't working and I didn't want to lower the battery on my phone because I needed Google Maps. So I was pretty much silent in the car, just waiting in traffic. By the time I get there, Jacob and this gentleman are still negotiating and it takes another hour. At this point, I'm starving, I'm hungry, but intuitively, I knew that this was the right thing to do. Not logically, by the way, because logically I could have been like, oh, well, I had a long day, I had all these things to do. I could have logically talked myself out of it, but intuitively, I knew this was the right thing to do. Once the hours were up, Jacob finally gets in my car and we're driving back. As we're driving back, he keeps expressing gratitude for me picking him up because a lot of people turned him down. And at that point, as we're almost about to get back to our place, Jacob says, yo, Armani, don't go to your place yet. Did you eat? I was like, no, why? We're gonna go to Petra. We're going to Petra? And Petra was this thing, a place that I was telling his brother about nonstop. And I guess his brother told Jacob and I was excited. I didn't eat all day. And this was a Caribbean place that apparently gave awesome food. By the time that we get in there, Jacob tells the waitress, hey, his meal is on me. Anything that he wants to get, he can get, it's all on me. I was like, nah, Jacob, come on, man. I got, I got this. Your meal is on me. And he's like, listen, I'll feel insulted if you pay for me. 
and I'll feel even more insulted if you don't let me buy you a meal, especially after waiting so long. So at this point, I gave him the car ride and he gave me a meal. This interaction went amazing and we both ended up feeling better once this interaction was done. Now this was peculiar to me because two weeks before, something strange had happened. I want us to temporarily leave this moment and I want us to rewind two weeks. Two weeks before, I was playing basketball with my friend Timothy and a few of our other friends. Now Timothy, this guy's a character. He's one of the few people in my life that taught me to weigh actions over words. And I don't mean this in a good sense because Timothy, he is probably one of the best speakers I've ever heard. He knows how to be charismatic. He knows how to speak in an audacious way. And he's just a great communicator. But what he lacks is heart. He doesn't have fire. He doesn't have discipline. When the going gets tough, Timothy gets the going. And on this particular day, we're over here playing basketball, and I guess Timothy slips and he hurts his ankle. But it's not too bad where he gets up and he's playing again. Once our game is done, Timothy is like, do you think my ankle is an issue because you know I fell like that? And the rest of us were like, I don't know. I mean, how's it feeling for you? Can you walk? Timothy, he's like, yeah, I, I can walk. So later on, for the next couple of days, he's walking completely fine. However, on the fifth day, he gets in a call with his mom and his mom is highly overprotective of her baby boy. And she's like, Timothy, you fell in basketball and you don't have a cast. You don't have crutches. Oh my, you're going to be injured for life. And this guy, Timothy, he's not a mentally tough kind of guy. Soon as he heard these words, suddenly he became sick. He's like, well, now that you bring it up, mom, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I don't feel too good. And this fool ends up buying a bunch of crutches. He starts putting this sort of cast on himself that he bought from CVS. And he's all of a sudden acting helpless. And now he wants his friends to help move around a few things in his apartment in order to make his life more convenient. Because he is on bed rest, you know? Now for me, I wouldn't mind if this was one of the first or the second or the third favor Timothy asked for. But this was roughly around the 15th favor that he's asked for in our short interaction with one another. And I found out anytime I asked him for a favor back, he would always find an excuse. And what would bother me even more was that these excuses were justified. Where if I would ask him for a ride to the airport, he'd be like, I have class. And you know, I'm not doubting that. I'm pretty sure he did have class. But it got annoying to me. I'm like, yo man, I'm always doing favors for you, but you're not really doing too many favors for me. But what am I gonna do? Tell my bed riddled friend that I can't help move some of his stuff around? The other friends agreed, so I ended up agreeing as well. And you know, Timothy was bossing us around. He was saying, no, 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 you gotta move this over here. No, man, come on, you guys gotta rush it. You gotta make it faster. And the entire time that I was giving, physically I was doing the work, but mentally I was off in another world. Physically I was giving, but mentally I was thinking, how am I going to take from Timothy? What is the next favor I'm going to ask him for because I'm helping him out here and I've helped him out many times before. And what started to happen was I started to feel more drained as I was giving. This moment with Timothy was different than the moment with Jacob, where with Jacob's scenario, after I was done giving that long car ride, I felt energized. While in Timothy's scenario, after I was done giving, I felt drained. Why the difference? The difference was due to 
intention. Here's the thing. When you give, give. When you take, take. What you should not do is think about taking when you're giving. And this third method is how a lot of people give. Trust me, I know because that's what I was doing with Timothy. The reason it was so different with Jacob was because when I gave, in my mind, I wasn't really thinking about taking at all because intuitively I knew that I had to give. This was the right thing to do. And at the end of the night, when Jacob surprised me by taking me to Petra and buying me food, I was in the mode of taking. So it was as though it was two different worlds. Where with Timothy, I'm over here blending the two worlds together, and that's a big no-no. If I'm going to blend the worlds together, then it's better if I don't even do the task at all. And the reason that all of this ties into speaking is because it's the same thing with speaking. When you speak, speak. When you're silent, be silent. But what you should not do is think about being silent when you're speaking. And this awkward mode is when a lot of people start mumbling. It's a deeply ingrained belief that as you're watching this, you're probably like, that's me. See, these beliefs are layers and layers and layers below our conscious awareness. And that's why I told you the story to help you draw the parallel. What's smart is to separate the two worlds. View speaking and being silent as two different entities. And the more that you view it as two different entities, you start having a on and off switch to speaking. When you're on, you're on. When you're off, you're off. Anything in the 95% range of it not being on should be considered off. It's the same thing with your actual light switch. If you put it right in the middle, it's still considered off. You're not going to get the light. So you need to train your mind, especially if you are someone who mumbles a lot, to separate these two worlds. And I wanna give you two different exercises in order to do that. The first exercise you could do by yourself. What I want you to do is get a timer and time yourself for one minute. For the first 30 seconds, you're going to speak. You're gonna say whatever comes to your mind or you could give yourself a certain topic and you're going to speak. And for the next 30 seconds, you're going to be silent. So in a minute time span, 30 seconds on speaking, 30 seconds on being silent. What you are doing is you're training the brain to see the two worlds as being separate. No longer are you combining it, you're separating it. And you can get creative with this exercise. You could give yourself five minutes, you could give yourself 10 minutes, and sometimes you can go from speaking for 30 seconds to being silent for 30 seconds, back to speaking, get creative with it. Our main goal is when we're speaking, we are predominantly focused on speaking. When we're silent, we're predominantly focused on being silent. That's exercise number one. Exercise number two is what I call the intention light switch. And this requires at least two people. So let's say it's you and you get your brother. I want your brother to pick up the role of someone who's difficult to work with, a stubborn person that does not take orders. And you, you're going to take up the role as a leader that needs to get this person to do a certain behavior. So let's say your goal is to get your brother to pick up a remote controller. You are going to say, John, pick up the remote controller. And you're going to say it in a firm but fair way. You're not going to be yelling at him like, John, pick up the co remote controller. Or you're not going to say it in a weak way. Like, John, uh, pick up the remote controller. You're going to say it in a firm but fair way, whatever that means to you. And your brother needs to be troublesome. He needs to say, no, I'm not gonna pick it up. And he needs to constantly keep challenging you, okay? And you, you are not going to waver. Each time you think that at this point, he is going to pick up the remote controller. So if he tells you no for 10 times, 
you must have the intention where you think that the 11th time is going to be a success. You can't know when he's going to say yes. So make sure you identify these rules with whoever your partner is going to be. They're going to be a troublesome individual who is not taking orders, but throughout your guys' interaction, at one point or another, they will take your orders, but you will not know when that moment is going to be. So these are the two exercises that you can choose from. The more that you practice, the more that you start to separate these two worlds. When you speak, you speak. When you're silent, you are silent. And the more that you separate these two worlds, the more that you will feel energized after you're speaking. The more that you will feel energized as you are being silent. Just like I learned the art of giving from Jacob and I saw the error in my ways with Timothy, hopefully you learn the correct way of speaking and being silent and you ditch the error ways as a thing of the past. For more practical insights like this into the world of speaking easy, be sure to check out my book, Speak Easy, How to Be Articulate, Assertive, and Audacious Around People. I cover tons of different concepts on how you can speak with more clarity, how you can gather your ideas and deliver it in a compelling way, and how you can build a primal brand so you start to build interactions who talk you up once you leave the room. Speak Easy is currently available on Amazon, ebook, and audiobook format. I'm going to drop all the links in the description box and the pinned comment right on below. Grab your copy today and level up your communication skills. Thank you very much for joining the Armani Talks YouTube channel, and I'll catch you on the next episode.